graduate admissions. Before I introduce you to both Leanna and Carol, I'd like to just take a minute and orient you to this online webinar environment. Just under our welcome message is the questions box, and you will see an empty box. You can type your questions in here throughout the entire webinar, click send, and all three of us will be able to read these questions and respond to you at the end of the presentation. So let's get started. Not everyone who is on the webinar today is familiar with Bay Path University, so I would like to give you a little bit of background information. We were established in 1897, and so we have a long history of providing educational opportunities for both women and men throughout the United States and internationally offering both on-campus and online programs at the graduate level for men and women and at the undergraduate level for women only. Accredited by the New England Association of Schools and Colleges, Bay Path University is a leader in education and offers a wide array of degrees that are focused on some of the most emergent careers such as the MFA in creative nonfiction, of course, higher education, genetic counseling, mental health counseling, applied data science, occupational therapy, leadership and negotiation, cybersecurity, and many more. A Bay Path University education empowers undergraduate women and graduate women and men to become leaders in their careers and communities with an innovative approach to learning that prepares students to flourish in a constantly changing world. Our over 30 online and on-ground graduate programs are perfect for the professionals and the pragmatists, for women and men juggling families and full-time jobs. In fact, 90% of our students work and attend graduate school at the same time. You are able to do so because we make your education as accessible and manageable as possible. And if you ask a Bay Path woman undergraduate to define her academic experience, it would be one word transformational. There is no other way to describe it. We have majors in neurobiology, cybersecurity and business analytics, biotechnology, creative writing, and legal studies, all at the undergraduate level. But we also educate the whole person, giving our women the courage and confidence to be their best self. It's why women's education still matters. At Bay Path University, students receive a great deal of personal attention through the admissions process and during their experience as a student. Our professors are both practitioners and faculty and bring a wealth of knowledge and expertise to the classroom. In addition, they are committed to giving our students the best support and encouragement throughout their experience at Bay Path. Again, thank you for joining us today. And now it is my pleasure to turn the presentation over to Leanna and Carol. Welcome. Leanna or Carol, can you hear me? Yes. This yes, is Carol. I'm so sorry. I went into a whole lovely introduction without realizing I had uh, neglected to unmute myself. Here I am. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to join us. It is my great pleasure to introduce Carol Joukowsky. And because, Carol, your biography is so unusual, I'd like to start our conversation by sharing your bio with our listeners, just to give us all an idea of the many worlds in which you have lived and the experience you draw on as a writer and writing instructor. You are a writer, writing coach, and former nun who left the Sisters of the Holy Cross and became part of the Sisters for Christian Community, an independent, self-governing sisterhood. Your many books include Forever and Ever, Amen, The Silence We Keep, a nun's view of the Catholic priest scandal, Sister Carol's book of spells and blessings, the bestseller, 10 fun things to do before you die, which was translated into Korean, Japanese, Chinese, and German, divine madness, why I still want to be a nun, and the cookbooks, let the good times roll and home on the range. You've been profiled and your work reviewed in Rosie Magazine, People Magazine, The Star Ledger, L, Italian edition, the Journal News, the New York Post, and the New York Times. And your television appearances include guest spots on Speakeasy, 
CNN, where you were interviewed by Soledad O'Brien, the early show, a live interview with Brian Gumble. I witnessed New Sunday morning, weekend today, in ABC TV, She TV, among others. You live in New York City and you hold a PhD from NYU. Your list of interests and accomplishments is impressive. And like no other writers I know, we've got so much to ask you about. So let's start at the beginning. I'd like to open with a question about your spiritual training and what led you to leave the Sisters of the Cross. Would you be able to talk to us a little bit about that first? Well, in terms of my spiritual training, I entered the Sisters of the Holy Cross at the unconscious age of 18 <laughs> and from um i'd say the first five years we were also college students at the time but this was the period in religious life before everything changed so it was the end of the old um where you there were 50 of us who entered most of us were 18 that was kind of the age when you entered and the days where it, they referred to it as like nun boot camp. You know, you were up at five. I would say a third of your day was common prayer. A third of your day was private prayer. And the other third was a combination of work. And um, I think probably an hour and a half was for recreation. That was the only time we were allowed to talk. The rest of the day was kept in silence. So it was like a kind of a, a urban plunge into the spiritual life where everything we read, the only books we could read were spiritual books. So there was this intense focus on developing the inner life. Uh, we were disconnected from family. We only saw our family twice a year. We can write to them once a year. Um, and there was no verbal communication. So for me, that's when my writing began, because it was the only way that I could communicate. And that was true for many of our sisters, you know, that the only way we could talk to each other was in writing. Um, and I was with the Sisters of the Holy Cross for 33 years. In 1996, at the age of 51, I had completed my Ph.D. at NYU. And my life in the sisterhood, I had no problem with the vow of poverty of living a simple life. I had no problem with the vow of celibacy of living a solitary life. Always the problem for me was obedience and being able to make my own decisions about what I wanted to do with my life. And that worked pretty well for me for 33 years. It was when I finished my PhD, and I was kind of on a track. I worked in college administration for 15 years, and I was on a track to become college president. So my PhD was in higher ed administration. When I finished that, I had already begun publishing. I think I had published three books, four books by that time, and wanted to pursue my life as a writer in New York City. At that point, the Sisters of the Holy Cross were asking me to go back into church work and to uh, move back into a convent. I had been living alone probably for 22 years at that time. And that's when it was the word back. It was moved back. Everything was back, back. And that's when I made the decision to um, transfer my membership to the Sisters for Christian Community. The Sisters for Christian Community started in 1972 when religious life was changing. You know, we were no longer in habits. Um, women were, sisters were doing all different kinds of work. We were in the inner city. Those who were educated in the law became lawyers. And many of them, things did not change in the way they wanted. And they started a new community. This was 72. And there were about a 1,000 women who didn't want to leave the sisterhood. They just envisioned living it differently. The big difference was self-governing, that uh, we have no superiors. Um, we decide everything 
by consensus, and by consensus I mean 100%. Um, we are self-supporting, so there's no, you know, the community doesn't take care of each other. We all support ourselves. We own nothing in common, so we don't have mother houses, hospitals, colleges. We don't have property. Um, and our sisterhood is inclusive, so there is no... Um, excluding of LBGT members, minorities. There's nothing exclusive. Everything, the world is our church, in other words. So I transferred to them in 1996. Um, there are 12, there are probably, we don't know how many there are nationally because we're not organized that way. I would say probably there's a thousand of us all over the world. Um, the way it works is you uh, move to an area, you look for sisters that are in your area, and you connect with them. There are probably 15 in my local group, and I'm in New York City. There's three of us in the city, some are in New Jersey, some are in Pennsylvania. When we first met, we were meeting every month. Now, that was 20 years ago. We're now 20 years older. People don't like to drive long distances. They don't like to drive at night. So now we get together four times a year for a weekend. We go away for a weekend together. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's kind of what led me. Mm -hmm. It was it was about being able to decide at the age of fifty one to decide what I wanted to do with my life, and it was to to uh, pursue the writing the writing work. And from what you said, it sounds as though you were writing long before you left the order, um, and that partly writing was a way to express when you couldn't express verbally in any other way, and that was common for many of the sisters as well. And that's very interesting. I did not know that. Um, I had imagined that maybe you started writing after you left, but it sounds as though this was a discipline that evolved over decades and we're publishing and studying in your PhD early on. So what I was going to ask about, and it makes it even more relevant, given what you've told me, is how your writing has informed your spiritual practice, or would you say it's the other way around, or would you say it's a dialectic that they each inform the other? Um, I'd say for me it's mostly the other way around. I kind of, I never took a writing course. I never got my MFA. I got my M, my master's degree in theology. I never followed the traditional path educationally to become a writer. So for me, it's like I became a writer inside out. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a matter of when the only thing you could listen to all day for five years <laughs> was your sort of your inner voice. Mm -hmm. That's when writing became a medium for me. Uh, that's where my ideas came from. Um, that's where I began hearing, you know, voices other than my own. Um, I don't know, call it, it conscience, call it gut instinct, call it intuition. But that's when I began tapping to another voice that writing became a medium for me. It was a way for me to be able to put into words what I was hearing that voice say. Mm -hmm. Now you and I guess that, no, oh, I guess in a way it does become it does become both. Um, but primarily for me, it's it's the um, my spiritual life that informs my writing. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, given that in your class, in the summer, you teach one of our most popular classes, um, Spiritual Writing Through the Ages. And students come out of that class transformed. And I wonder if you could share with us a little bit about how you teach your students to use writing as a contemplative practice, or as you were talking, how to have the contemplative practice um, give birth to the writing. Um, so why don't we start with what you 
what we're talking about when we say contemplative practice, how we understand it, I think many people think of it as going away, withdrawing from the world, you know, going to a mountaintop and seeing uh -huh. And um, for many writers, that's not possible, but yet the, the desire for that inner voice and that communion with the self is very strong. So can you tell us what it means to you and, and what are some of your techniques for tuning into the inner voice? Um, for me, I mean, I live, uh, you know, I live by myself, so I live a very contemplative life in the middle of New York City. I don't know if you can hear or not, but there's construction going on right outside my window. Um, <laughs> and for me, it doesn't make any difference where you are. It's the ability to, wherever you are, to kind of surround yourself with silence, mm -hmm. that you do have to kind of step away from what your ordinary life is in order to be able to listen. And for, and for us, when we start in the class, the very first thing we read is the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, which is not a traditional canonical gospel, where she speaks about, she refers to it as the new, the N-O-U-S, but it's kind of the angel in the soul, and that everyone has this. And meditation is what sort of enables us to listen to that voice. You know, when you first start meditating, you hear all kinds of voices. You hear the voices of your friends. You hear the voices of your parents. You hear the voices of your husband. And then it's to sift through those to get to the voice of who it is that's, that's speaking to you, where do your ideas come from? Um, so like when we, when we read The Cloud of Unknowing, I ask them to talk about or to write about the clouds of unknowing they've passed through in their own lives. Yeah. Um, when we read The Dark Night of the Soul, they're asked to talk about all of the dark times in their life where they couldn't see what was ahead of them. So it's kind of to push the writer to talk about the things that they're most afraid to write about, to give a voice to the things that are the hardest to talk about, because that's what people find most interesting. I mean, that's the stuff of everyday life that ordinary people can relate to. Nobody goes through life without having those experiences. And I think it's what brings out, what I find is the deeper they go, the clearer their writing voice becomes. And when they write things like that, you know, I don't pay attention to grammar. I don't pay attention to punctuation. It's that what they end up telling me is, I didn't know I thought that. You know, I didn't know I could write that. Um, I didn't remember that. So it taps into a voice that's their truest self, their best self, and I think is is their their clearest and truest writing voice. I resonate very much to what you're saying. Um, I start my day at five thirty, ideally. Um, sometimes not. Oh so God, you're a nun. That's when we started our day. <laughs> I know. And over time, I found that it was the only way, um, if I waited until, say, the evening, after, at the end of the workday, my head was filled with everything that I had been doing. And I find that when I come straight out of the dream state and go into a meditation for an uh -huh. hour, that I have the best experiences. And it's, that's when I have the quiet. And then I come out of that and I write in my journal. Um, and if I start my day like that, it sets the tone for everything that comes after it, um, including my writing. And uh -huh. as hard as it is, and it was very hard to train myself to do this because I'm a natural night owl, but I, I learned to do it. And I'm, I mean, I think there are many ways for me that's what works. Um, and that deeper inner listening, you anticipated my next question, which was how the writing itself improves when you you went right to it about 
the writing actually gets clearer and it gets deeper and more honest. Um, even surprisingly, even when people are not necessarily trying, I find that's true um, for myself and the students. And it sounds like you see the same thing in your class. You know, and I found that once you have that experience, you know, once somebody writes something and it it's like, I didn't even know I was going to write this. I don't know where it came from. Once you have that experience, you know how to get back in touch with that voice and you trust it more. Mm-hmm. Um, because what, it's unlike anything you've done before. It's a new idea. It's it's a memory that you pulled out of you don't know where. Um and a lot of times when students are trying, it's like, oh, I don't remember that, you know. And I'm like, don't don't worry about not remembering because oftentimes, and I found this when I wrote the memoir, Forever and Ever, Amen, when I was trying to recall my first seven years in the convent. And I had um, this friend of mine, she's a psychic, but she said, you know, and I said, I'm afraid I won't remember that stuff. I said, there are years that are just a big block to me, Mm. uh, a big blank. And she said, you've got to trust your memories that one will trigger another. And I find that's what happens with students, that once they remember one thing, um, or if they're talking about people who are, you know, departed from this life. I'm like, talk to those people. Ask them to help you remember. And at first that's kind of creepy for them because they're not used to thinking that way. Mm -hmm. But once you kind of tap into the spirit world and trust that world and trust the voices that you hear, um, I find that's where their best stuff comes from. I find the same thing in my classes and in in my own practice. And, um, you know, it can take courage to do that. And I know that for some of our students, it it does feel strange at first, and then it's exhilarating. And then it's it's such a wonderful discovery to know, I've got that material in me. Like you Uh were saying, I didn't know. And and then you just want to keep going and what there is more to discover. Uh In that deep uh-huh. um, and that's where they get the experience of, you know, I wrote for seven hours, you know, <laughs> or I wrote till two in the morning, um, you know, that it starts and it's like, I just couldn't stop. I just kept going. And I think that's, that's exciting for a writer. Um, once you can tap into that voice and trust and to be able to listen. And I think that's what, you know meditation does for you um it teaches you how to listen to your voice independent of all the other voices you hear all day long Mm -hmm. which is getting more difficult to do with the cacophony in our social media and media in general and just the noise of the world and and there's very much to pay attention to in the world especially right now huge challenges out in the world. So it becomes even more necessary, I think, for us as writers to have that special time, whenever we can Uh get it, however we can get it, um, to tune those out and find what's true in ourselves. Um, I wanted to ask you about your books. I'm looking at this beautiful slide here with only four of your titles, um, and there are many more. And I was thinking, about what unites your books with um, the exception of the silence we keep, um, which is extremely painful, difficult material. Um, So much joy um, in your book, in your cookbooks as well. And I wonder, could you tell us just a little bit about the genesis of your books? And and was it your goal from the beginning to have this thread of joy winding through? Um, Was that something you discovered and were surprised by? Um, I think it's half and half for me. Half of the books I wrote sort of came to me. Like the first cookbook I did, which was published in 1980, it was the first book I published. Um, I was a residence hall director. Uh, 
gifts on my staff, and I couldn't afford to get any of them anything for Christmas. So I decided, and the only way I can get them to come to meetings was to cook something, you know, to feed them. (laughs) So I thought I would make uh, a cookbook of all of the things that I had cooked for them during the year. And I had, you know, and no, we didn't have, you know, it was run off on mimeograph machines. And they had a Christmas bazaar at St. Mary's. And the women in the duplicating department said, you know, you ought to sell these at the Christmas bazaar. And I mean, it was a paperback. It was probably about 20 pages. It was put together with those brass claps where you, clasps where you punch a hole. <laughs> and we built it at the Christmas Bazaar as the perfect gift for someone you don't want to spend more than two bucks on. Well, by the end of the day, I had $1,000. Um, and there's a, a Ave Maria Press, which is at the University of Notre Dame. I didn't even know they were a press. And, you know, we were laughing about that. And... I said to the students, I said, you know, you're laughing about this book now, but one day the phone's going to ring and it's going to be a publisher wanting to publish this. Well, the phone rings <laughs> and it's this person saying, my name is Joan Bellina and I'm from Ave Maria Press. And I thought it was a student from the front desk, you know, like fooling around. So uh-huh. I said, oh, yeah, and I'm sure Pater Noster is another press that you run. And she <laughs> said, no, my husband. She said, my husband's in the biology department, and he gave me a copy of your book. Well, I knew Joe, I knew her husband, and she said they wanted to know if they could publish it. And I said, sure, go ahead. Uh, and then it was followed by, and the, 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 the Let the Good Times Roll, I did everything. I designed the cover. The, in, the contents were hand printed. I even made up what the critics have to say on the back. Um, and it oh, ended okay. up being one of their best sellers. And then they wanted Home on the Range. And in essence, they said to me, we will publish whatever you write. Mm-hmm. Um, and 10 Fun Things was a lecture that I had given. This was back in the 80s where the big fad on campuses, it was called the last lecture series. And you were supposed to pretend this was the last lecture you were given before you died, the day before you died. What would you tell them? And I had made up a list of the things I was glad I did before I died that they should think about doing before they died. And the student who was student body president said to me, you know, sister, this is like another book. And Ave Maria picked it up and printed it. Um, So my first, you know, it's completely atypical, but half of my book sort of came to me from ideas that I had already done. Um, That was also true with The Silence We Keep, the the Mm -hmm. book on the, um, the sex scandal and the priesthood. It was an editor... Uh, of mine who had done the memoir Mm -hmm. um, Forever and Ever Amen and he said they were looking for a nun to write a book on the sex scandal. Would I be interested? And I said well sure, you know and he said can you do it in six weeks? (gasps) And I said oh yeah yeah I could do that (laughs) and then I hung up and I thought, I looked at the calendar and I said six weeks Um, and I did it and I looked at priesthood in the beginning, priesthood in the middle ages and priesthood now. And I had no idea what I was going to write about, but what I had found was it kind of revealed a history of hypocrisy and organized crime in the Catholic church. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was kind of my conclusion So here's a good example. As a sister of the Holy Cross, I could not have published that book because it would have needed to have been approved by the bishop. Um, So I could not, that book could not have been published as a sister of the Holy Cross. Um, And that was probably, I would have to say, the hardest book I wrote, mostly because of content and my own struggle with Catholicism. Um, And it was interesting because 
I sort of thought, oh, you know, I'm just going to get clobbered. And there was absolute silence on the. Of course, there was nothing that the church could have said because they had no authority over me. Um, mm-hmm. So if, I did find out, though, a friend of mine who I went to high school with is a priest, and he's still in a parish in Indiana, and he called me and he said, Hey, Carol, you just made the list. I said, what list? He said, you're now on the list of people who are not allowed to talk on Catholic property. And then he read read me a list of the, I said, well, at least I'm in esteemed company. You know, it's a list of theologians and, you know, anyone who voiced dissent in the Catholic Church is on this list. But So I take great pride when I pass the Catholic Church that I start talking loudly. (laughs) You know, I think many of us who grew up in the Catholic Church um, have gone through similar struggles as we became writers and moved away from some of the dogma of it. Um, In my case, moved away from the faith entirely toward a different one. Um, But Mm -hmm. I still retain a lot of what was beautiful and remains beautiful. Um, And I wonder if I'm on that list. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, But that was brave of you. And I wonder... How did you keep your sense of self and peace when writing about something so shocking to so many of us? Um, What what we all discovered and what you discovered going deeply into it is how much pain there was and how how many. Mm -hmm. And was it difficult for you not to absorb that pain? And how did you move through it with, did your practice help you? Well, I think this is where um, the Sisters for Christian Community were enormously supportive. Uh, When we get together, we celebrate Eucharist around the table. Mm -hmm. Uh, Many of our sisters, as a matter of fact, one of our sisters was one of the, she was one of the first to be ordained a Catholic priest. Uh, There are now hundreds of women who have been ordained. She was ordained the first Catholic bishop, and she now goes all over the world ordaining women. Um, Many of our sisters belong to house churches, which is where Christianity began, Mm -hmm. where groups of people who who are no longer in full communion with the Catholic Church because they cannot um, support many of their teachings. So there's, and I, you know, I think even nationally and probably internationally, you know, the fastest growing group of, if you want to call religions, is what they call the nuns, the Mm -hmm. N-O-N-E-S. Those who are not part of organized religion, but who are still committed to pursuing their own spiritual life and are looking for a community of people to support that. And that's where I see myself now. Um, most of the people, and I belong to many, many communities. The Sisterhood is one, several communities of people that I'm part of in the city. And they're all people who have disconnected, whether it's Judaism or whatever organized religion they grew up in. Um, they're no longer part of that formally. But, and I think, you know, we Catholics are in or out of the pew, you're always a Catholic. I mean, you're born that way. It's sort of like, you know, the friends I know who are Jewish, they don't do synagogue anymore, um, but they're still Jewish. It's almost like a cultural thing, or it's just part of the fabric of who you are. So I think, you know, myself included, that those of us who have disconnected in formal ways, are finding other ways to nourish the things that are important to us, community, service, a prayer life, a spiritual life, um, and some sense of finding other people who are like that. Um, I think that sense of, because people often ask me, you know, well, what's happening to the sisterhood? You know, that a lot of religious communities, the numbers are dwindling and And I said, there are all kinds of sisterhoods that I know of. I said, I'm part of at least four of them in the city. My mother belonged to a group of 12 women 
who got together once a month and played cards and drank cocktails in the 50s. <laughs> and that- I mean, there's just, yeah, there's that instinct. Um, I don't know if it's in true f- as true for men, but it certainly is true for women. You know, I like what we're talking about here because it can seem as though we're talking about two different things. Um, the inner voice and the contemplative practice, which involves solitude, and then the community. And yet I find that those are part of the same continuum and that they nourish Mm -hmm. each other. And Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if, if we could talk just a minute more about how that, how and why community is important to a writer, including writers who want to go deep into the self. And, and how it can actually serve that both ways. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, I think it's um, the two things that I found in my traditional, you know, my formal training in the sisterhood, that there were two things that were ended up being critical to my writing life. Mm-hmm. One was the sense of community or sisterhood. Um, and the other was the ability, and, uh, you know, even though we could only recreate for an hour and a half a day, that was mandatory. So the ability to do nothing or the ability to play. And I think for both of those, what it does for me as a writer is it takes my mind off myself. You know, it puts your focus on other areas that are soul food for you, that are nourishing for you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Community is one of those for me, sisterhood. It's things that are fun, things that you love to do, that the focus is not on yourself and what you're working on. Um, So it, it, it shifts your focus somewhere else, but it's just as nourishing in ways that are almost I, I don't know exactly how, but I always know that when I my mind is freer or I'm not as intensely focused on you know like when people talk about writer's block like I can't get anywhere, and I'm like then leave it alone, you know do something else, um, do nothing, you know there's that sense of almost like brooding on an idea. You know, when you think of like a hen on a chicken, where you do nothing but sit on it and wait for something else to come. And that's where I find things helpful, like community or volunteering or, uh, you know, like I tutor first graders in reading every day. Um, You know, to do something else that you love to do that I always refer to as soul food that feeds your writing voice in a different way. Um, does that make sense? Absolutely. We talk about that often in, in the classes I teach about um, a sense of brooding exhaustion can sometimes set in in the middle of a writing project, especially when it's difficult. Uh-huh. And sometimes students feel that because we're raised with a very Puritan work ethic in this country and we valorize that, And that tells you to buckle down and just work harder. Um, Uh And there perhaps there are times when that can be helpful when you're building a house Um, and and the tornado is coming. So you really got to get that roof on. But there are other times when walking away and and nourishing yourself exactly as you said, and play can be such a big part of that. So Uh a lot, make sure you build in time to just refresh because the exhausted mind is not the creative mind. Um, the ideas don't come as well. And I learned that the hard way too, um, by sitting down and trying to crank out for hours and hours and hours, um, not giving myself time to refresh, replenish, play. Um, and I've really uh-huh. learned that. And it's funny that you'd think one has to learn sometimes to play. Um, but I think for some of us that might be true when we really care about what we're doing It's important. And I I think framing it as part of the work we're doing can really help. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I give it as an assignment. (laughs) Yeah. You know, when I finished um, 
the silence we keep after six weeks. Mm -hmm. And I was just exhausted after I finished that. And I I felt like I could never write another book again. Mm -hmm. And I remember I picked up Jung's book on active imagination. And he talked about, um, he was talking in particularly about writers. And he said, whenever you finish a work of one kind, before you begin another work of the same kind, do the opposite of what your craft is. And he said, for instance, if you're a writer, paint. And and I did. I and you know, I was not a painter, so you know, a friend of mine is. So she gave me some canvases and some paints and. You know, I started painting these, we refer to them as the South Park Saints, you know, these kind of uh, folk art, folk religious art paintings, Mm. and ended up over the last probably, I don't know, 15 years, doing close to 300 paintings, um, half of which were sold, half of which were given away. But what it does is it sort of activates the other part of your brain. Um. And then I was able to go back and, you know, um, jump into writing. And I still wrote every, I write every single day. I've been doing that since 1970, right? I write at the beginning and the end of every day. Mm -hmm. Um, But it was a much, I noticed a difference in my writing voice when I did that. It was clearer, it was calmer, um, it was more focused, it wasn't as distracted, Mm-hmm. Um, and I, st- I still, I still do both now. I do the writing and the painting both. For me, it's, um, baking. <laughs> yes. Yeah, same thing. Same thing. Yeah. With my hands, I put the music on, I dance around the kitchen, I get out the flour and sugar, um, and then you can eat creative products. So that's, that's another part that I really like about it and I can share it with others. So. I'm always the one to sign up for the dessert when it's a potluck. Um, but that's uh-huh. exactly that. You know, Carol, I'm looking at the time and I'm mindful of wanting to leave time open for our listeners to ask questions. So I just wanted to conclude with one question and then we'll open it up. Um, what would you say um, to, let's say, a busy writer, somebody who has a full time job and maybe is raising children or is caring for an aging parent and has family obligations, which in fact is most of us. And what would you say are the two or three most important things that that person can do in starting to tune into that inner voice and develop it as a practice? I think the first thing, um, at least for me, is every day to do something that you love to do, Mm -hmm. uh, regardless of what that is. Um, Because what that does is it's it's soul food for you. It feeds your soul, whatever that is, Uh, whether it's listening to music or baking, whatever, but to do something every day that you love to do. Um, If possible to give your to to give yourself gosh i don't know 15 minutes or a half an hour if you can pull apart from your life and for most people who have busy lives you know like you said it's going to happen at the beginning or the end of the day mm-hmm. but to give some time for yourself um you know, for me, it's easy to do because I live alone and I can give as much of that to myself as I want. But that's important. I think for writers to write every day, even if it's a sentence, uh, at the end of the day, I always write about what were the best parts of the day and what were the hardest parts of the day. Um, so that would be the second thing. And I think the third thing for me is to just, like, do nothing. Think about nothing, um, something that's kind of playful. Um, This could be with your kids. This could be with your husband. But something that's just mindless. 
you know, that takes your attention away from whatever it is that's most stressful or most difficult. Um, but again, I think it's to identify what what is soul food for you, like what really nourishes you, and to make sure that that stuff is, is a part of your daily life. Uh, and that's a discipline. You know, that's an exercise. That's lovely. And it is, isn't it? I think many people think, oh, boy, this is going to be quite a solemn endeavor, you know, uh, establishing a spiritual or contemplative practice is going to involve a lot of self-sacrifice and discipline. And I think it can be very surprising to learn a lot of it has to do with playfulness and joy. And like you said, nothingness, not not having to push. You know, all that's part of it, too. Um, and, and it can Oh, be- yeah. I mean, for me, writing is the it, there's nothing more I would rather do. Uh, it's fun for me. It's interesting for me. Um, I never know what's going to happen. I never know what's going to come out. Um, and like I said, for writers, that's where our ideas come from. Mm-hmm. You know, our, our souls are like wellsprings of endless ideas, uh, if we can tap into that. I could talk about this all day with you. Okay. <laughs> and I have many <laughs> but I don't want to spend all the time um, because I want to let our listeners have an opportunity to ask their questions too. We've covered so much ground and you've shared a lot with us and I would like to open it up now. If you have a question for Carol, please go ahead and type it in the chat box and we can wait for a few moments. Sometimes it takes a while to sit and think about what you've heard before your question comes up. So there's no rush on it. Um, but I will ask Cheryl, she's able to see the questions as they're coming up. Do we have any, Cheryl? Not yet, we do not. Okay, Um, while we're waiting then, um, I'm gonna go ahead and ask you one more and see if others want to chime in. Carol, can you recommend some books for us that might be helpful to someone either wanting to go deeper or starting a practice that has to do with writing and contemplation. What books have inspired you? You mentioned Jung, um, the book of active imagination, and I know you've worked with uh, the Brenda Euland book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mentioned, um, I mean, what, what other books do you think we would be interested in? I think, um, let me see. I'm trying to think of the ones the students like the best. The Brenda Euland, for sure. I think to pick, um, I think to pick up a memoir. Mm-hmm. Um, the ones I'm thinking of are maybe Thomas Merton's Seven Story Mountain mm-hmm. uh, would be one. Um, some of the mystical writings the students find helpful, but that's it's kind of a struggle reading because it's almost a different language Mm -hmm. uh, when you're reading things from the 14th and 16th century. But there are, but the thing I found about those, especially like the cloud of unknowing Mm -hmm. or Teresa of Avila's interior castle, they loved of, because it sort of takes you into the different dimensions of the inner life. Um, but they're they're readings that sort of push you in that direction of discovering what the inner life is, you know what what goes on there, um, mm-hmm. you know to hear them write about you know the different mansions in their own souls, I mm-hmm. found purely enlightening. Um, so it's a different way to think about the spiritual life. And then I would suggest, you know, get on Amazon, look in spiritual books, and whatever speaks to you. Um, I mean, there, there are so many books out there that are, um, you know, the, the Buddhist nun, Pema Chodron, you mm-hmm. know, writes about the places that scare you, Um you know, things that that are easily accessible. Um, 
But I always find just sort of scanning book lists and whatever pops up to you. Um, you know, as my aunt used to say, if it speaks to you, buy it. Mm-hmm. Um, that books will, you'll find something. I just finished a lovely book, a conversation between the Dalai Lama and Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Uh, mm. uh, they were talking together, um, an interfaith conversation um, about their various practices and how they live their faith in the world. Um, mm-hmm. it was lovely. And there was so much laughter in the book, which was delightful. Um, so Cheryl, how are we doing? Do we have? It looks like we do have a question that has come up. Hi, Carol. I loved listening to you speak. I was curious if there was a writer whose work you tried to model yourself after, or if you ever had a writing mentor you liked working with. Thanks, mm-hmm. Maria. Great question. Um, you know, the writers I was first drawn to um, were E.E. E. Cummings and Gertrude Stein. And the reason I think I like both of them is because they had no regard for punctuation, no regard for sentence structure. Um, Everything was kind of free form. Um, But there was, if I had to say that there was a mentor for my writing, I don't know that it was a person in this life. Um, I always see Gertrude Stein as a mentor of mine. Emily Dickinson and I share the same birthday, so I always Mm -hmm. call on her. So I have several spirit guides that I call on um, as kind of my mentors. And usually whenever I write something, I always read aloud at the end of the day what I've written. And I can kind of tell from that if it's my voice. You know, if it's clear enough. Um, but I don't, I'm trying to think of mentors. Uh, probably the editors I've had mm-hmm. in the books that I've done um, have been my best mentors. And I've had really good editors. Um, of course, they've all said to me, it's because your work needs a little editing. But it, um <laughs> I've always find that they're the ones that fine tune whatever I'm doing mm-hmm. um, in terms of, um, you know, focus and organizing ideas. So I would have to say my editors have been my best mentors. And my students, I think, um, also in terms of the things I learn from them about how they learn to write. Um, so it's kind of the thing I love about teaching is it's just as much a learning experience for me. When I see how other students learn how to write. Um, but I'm trying to think of other men. I, I would have to say my editors have been my best. And I'll name them by name, Maureen O'Brien and Jake Morrissey were my two best editors, Uh, Mm -hmm. one at Riverhood and one that was at HarperCollins. Um, You know, there's nothing better than a good editor. Oh, uh, worth your weight in gold. Absolutely. I wonder about the poets that you mentioned. You mentioned E.E. Cummings and Emily Dickinson and Gertrude Stein wrote poetry as well. Have you ever written poetry? You know, <laughs> I the poems I write are, um, you know, like one I wrote, this I wrote in the novitiate, and it was, this is my type of poetry, and it was the sunbeam poem. And it was, she was a sunbeam all sparkling and bright, shedding her rays from left and from right. She was a sunbeam with zeal unabated. She was a sunbeam, and boy, was she hated. <laughs> So that's the kind of poetry I write. (laughs) But, you know, poetry has never been a medium for me. Um, 
And I, you know, Mary Oliver is probably one of my favorite contemporary poets that's still in this, who's still in this life. Um, that kind of narrative poetry. Um, but I've not yet, not yet entered the poetry world. But you never know because there are always surprises in that, in that deep self. I've, I've never either, I've written, I think, in every other form. Um, and my attempts at poetry um, did not lead me where I wanted to go. Um, but mm -hmm. I think that poetry still can nurture me. And that's true for many of the writers in our program. Cheryl, I wanted to just make sure, because we only have a few minutes not to leave yes. anything out, if there was another question. Um, we do. Um, I recently wrote a 40-day devotional that has been received very well by my community and church. What are some ways that I can continue to encourage readers to take their own contemplative journey beyond reading the devotional? Hmm. Hmm. I think for me, it would be to encourage to encourage people to write every day um, as a spiritual practice. Um, because what it's, what it's done for me is it makes me more attentive to my daily life, to every day. When I think at the end of every day, what was the best part and the worst part of the day. And then on New Year's Eve, every year I pull out all the journals from the past year and make the 10 best and the 10 hardest parts of the year list. And it's a way of, first of all, making yourself listen to your writing voice every single day um, to make that become a part of your daily routine. It also makes you more conscious and more mindful um, about the way that you respond. Because I often think it's not what happens to us that's most important as a reader. It's what we do with what happens to us. And that's what I find most helpful in writing. What did I do with the day that was given to me? How did I respond to this person? How did I respond to that person? What did I do with my time? Um, so for me, it's it's writing every day. It's It's that spiritual practice that I think makes us more mindful, makes us more thoughtful, teaches us how to listen, teaches us how to see, and I think makes us um, inevitably more contemplative. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. Um, one final question. I think this is really all that we have time for for this afternoon. Um, is Mary Magdalene's uh, NOUS the angel in our soul, what we are tapping into as writers. Can you talk a bit about that? Um, yeah. In, you know, and I think prob certainly as Catholics, we learn that we are all born with a soul. And that is the Holy Spirit in us. And that the voice within us, when she talks about the angel of our soul, what she's saying is we all have a Holy Spirit within us that speaks to us all the time. Call it the voice of conscience. Call it gut instinct. Call it intuition. But it's kind of our guiding voice. Um, if we listen to it, it's what will lead us in the direction we want to go, lead us to do what is best for us. Um, the other thing I found that it does is it teaches us to look at mistakes in our life as turning points, as not as like awful things that we've done or sinful things that we've done, but things where we didn't listen closely enough and where we get the insight and the understanding to move in a different direction. So it's kind of our spirit guide. Um, it's, the, you know, we were taught as Catholics, we all get an angel at our side. And it's that voice in us that leads, you know, that's kind of our, our guide through this life. Thank you so much, Carol. I've enjoyed this tremendously. 
And I'm so glad the conversation doesn't have to end because we have Writer's Day coming up on Sunday. So for those who live within driving distance of our Longmeadow campus, we are having a wonderful afternoon on Sunday, this Sunday the 15th, of writers giving panels and talks and workshops. And Carol is going to be our visiting artist all next week on campus. And we're kicking off her visit with a panel about spiritual writing in conversation with another one of our MFA faculty members, Sophronia Scott, um, who recently came out with a memoir, This Child of Faith. And we're going to go even deeper into this topic. If you can, please join us. You can get information about it on the top page of the MFA webpage. And you can also get this um, PowerPoint and a recording of the webinar mailed to you if you would like, just let Cheryl know. And any questions about the MFA, same thing. My contact information is there on the webpage. Um, please email me. I would be happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank Thanks. you. Everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks everyone for attending. And again, we will be following up to everyone with a recording of today's webinar. So please stay tuned within the next uh, several days for that. Uh, take care. See you soon. At okay, the next thanks a lot. Topic. This was great. Thanks, Cheryl. Thanks, Carol. Thanks. See you Sunday. See you Sunday.